Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini in the Instex Mini 7 and the Instex Mini 25, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Photo Publicist, providing worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development for the photographer, turning photographers into celebrities. You can find out more information over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the highest quality work known to mankind anywhere on this planet. Unbelievable developing, scanning, and of course, output on high quality Fuji Crystal Archive. Unbelievable cool stuff these guys are up to. And remember, you don't have a photograph unless you have a print in your hand and you need to print your pictures. This is important. You need to supply proofs to your customers and even print your own work because it's not about looking at it on a monitor. It's about holding a print in your hand. Definitely check these guys out at Richard Photo Lab, of course at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not slip off your shoulder, guaranteed bar none, the coolest strap around. Our friends at Iger Studios for the finest quality drum scans known to mankind, Iger Studios. Dot com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web, www.apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.eastmanhouse.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo, we're going to be here with Joel Serrato. Joel is a analog photographer, but he actually shoots analog motion photography that's right joel is a filmmaker a cinematographer and he shoots guess what film that's it we're gonna talk to joel about his photography his movies what he's up to and all the great stuff that he's doing joel how you doing today hey scott it's going great how are you good buddy thanks for joining us here on inside analog photo we've been looking forward to having you on the program to talk about your beautiful photography if people don't know joel that you're a film shooter but more so you're a motion film shooter you're a cinematographer Yes, that's right. Thank you so much for having me. I know it's been kind of a phone call tag game here trying to get together, but I'm glad that we're able to finally get together and talk about this interview. Yeah, no, your work is fabulous, and I wanted people just to be able to look at this and chat about it. So, Joel, tell us about what you do. Well, generally speaking, my business is all 8 millimeter film-based. It's kind of the product that I offer for my clients. It's the medium that I'm passionate about filming in. I love the look of the saturated colors that film gives and the nostalgia really that is produced through this medium. I think my clients like it too because I've successfully had a business now for three years offering this film work and really not having to buy a digital camera or any sort of thing like that. I'm a 100% film shooter. All of my footage is put to music. My clients seem to love it and I love that my clients love it. So that's really the general idea of it. Everything's shot on film, then everything is transferred, and then at that point, it's a digital file, and I kind of take it to the computer and do my little film work that I do. Let's talk about the notion here of capturing weddings and these special moments on motion film. I think that everybody has seen these horrible, nasty videos, and I'm not saying that everybody that shoots wedding videos is horrible and nasty, but video has this very clinical, sterile I don't know. It's like watching a soap opera on TV. It's too (laughs) real. I don't know what it is, but you know what I mean when you watch a soap opera? Everything's right. videoed, right? So it's missing something. Right. And I think that capturing the day and especially the way the Super 8 runs and it's got a flicker and there's an organicness to it because it's film, it is very unique. 
No, I think that's true. I think there's a lot of cliche wedding videographer talk out there. And I think that this is definitely a little bit of a different medium and approach to wedding filmmaking. And I think that at least what I'm creating is a little more in the moment basis. There's some few direction here and there, but it's very subtle and it's nothing that is obtrusive in anybody's faces or anything that's going to make anybody feel like they're having a music video done or everything has to be perfect. It's really just being there the day of and letting things unfold naturally. And really, I'm just there with the camera, making sure that my lighting is pretty decent and that I can give my clients the best from what is happening in their moment. Let's talk about your background. Have you always been making movies? Have you always wanted to shoot this kind of stuff? What got you into wanting to be a cinematographer and capturing these special moments? I think people have the whole story of, I got a camera from my grandpa when I was like three and the whole story, and those are great to hear. But I think my story is a little bit different. I really stumbled upon this accidentally, I have to say, maybe about five years ago. I've been around photography maybe about seven or eight years or so. Jose Villa, who is an amazing photographer and my partner, so I've constantly been around his photography and all of his work. And so I kind of just admired it from afar really just constantly saw photography and him getting published and really just thought, wow, how cool is it is to be creative and to have your work showcased that way. And immediately I knew that wedding photography in general was something totally different through his eyes than what I was used to seeing. I'm Mexican, so you hire the $800 photographer and everything's shot on flash on a bright day. So there's all these portraits of Mexicans who don't smile and the whole sad look and it's just really weird. So when I saw Jose's photography, I was like, wow, this is something totally different than what I'm used to seeing. And I think it's something very special. And so just accidentally, Jose started shooting 8mm film. Believe it or not, the guy's even great at shooting 8mm film. And I don't even think people really know that. But he gifted it to some friends of ours, Cameron Ingalls and Anna Ingalls, who are some great photographers out of the San Luis Obispo area. And we were invited to their wedding, and so he kind of picked up the camera and shot a little bit for them. And he also did it for another photographer by the name of Michelle Warren, and she's out in Napomo area. And Michelle's also a film shooter, so yay! But kind of just did this for fun, and then I was like, hey, I think that's cool. I wanted to give that a try. And so we bought this $20 camera, and I shot a bunch of footage of my dogs and my family and that sort of thing. Really, I don't even know if I knew how to focus the thing, and I really don't even know how to tell you what I actually got from the footage because the footage never really was looked at after it was developed. It was just kind of something that was an outlet for me and something that I thought was fun and creative, and we just kind of left it at that. And then Jose had a destination wedding, and this was a really big gig, and so he was kind of nervous about it. And he's like, hey, why don't you come along and shoot 8 millimeter for my clients and just kind of give them this product and have it be something extra and this and this. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that because I think that this is just kind of an outlet for me. And my background is I had the whole corporate job. I was the youngest from a 900 employee company based out of New York. And so I was this whole corporate guy who was not creative at all and didn't really have creative ability or so I thought I didn't. And so I thought, no, that's really weird. I don't think I want to do that. And he's like, come on, just come along and do it and do your thing and shoot it. It'll be something extra. And so I thought, okay, I'll come along. I remember going abroad on this trip and really thinking, oh my gosh, am I even focusing this camera right? How do I even (laughs) use this thing? I know lighting a little bit since I've been around Jose for a while, but I don't really know if this is the right thing for me. So he says, just do your own thing. It's extra. Don't worry about it. There's no pressure. Okay, great. So I kind of just went on and shot this wedding and had all these moments happen and just was really into it. And I think it was really special because there were children and families and people who were all together at this one place and time and moment for this other couple's love. And I thought, wow, this is so special. And at that point, there was almost this immediate sense of responsibility. I had to capture those moments. There was no question about it. I was no longer doing this just for fun. This was my job now. And so I kind of just shot everything. And then at the end of the wedding, Jose says to me, hey, how do you think you did on the footage? And I said, oh my gosh, this was so easy that I'm afraid that I think I screwed this up. And he's, no, no, I think you probably did fine. Don't worry about it. And so we come back home and I go back to the nine to five corporate job and we send the footage off in my lab that I use now, which is Spectra Film and Video, and they're out of North Hollywood. They're incredible people. You guys should definitely check them out. They really care about their clients and really produce some of the best quality work. 
that there ever is any little hesitations or problems I can call them and they really are there for me. They explain things to me. I'm not the most technical guy. I'd like to say that I'm more like accidental artist type of person. So I just kind of do my job and they do the rest and they make my stuff look amazing. So my hat goes off to those guys over there. Anyways, I was at the whole corporate job and then I get a phone call from Jose and he's like, hey, the footage is in. It's here. I'm going to open it. And I was like, don't open it. This needs to be opened. When I get home, I need to look at this. Being around Jose and his success and his photography is really kind of a really good balance for me because I have a really harsh critic that kind of tells me things very forward and says, that is good, but maybe you should have looked out for this situation or your lighting isn't the best there. And so I was immediately afraid of all of those judgments because this was my first time doing a wedding and that sort of thing. So he calls me and he says, I already saw the footage. And there's this dead silence. (laughs) And he says, the footage is absolutely beautiful, Joel. And I was like, wow, no way. So in that instance, I was ready to come home, ready to just see the footage. And so I drive home super fast. And I pop the DVD into the DVD player and I look at the footage and I was, wow, how do I do this over and over again? This has to be what I do. I can't believe that I created this. And so I guess that's just kind of how it started. And immediately thereafter, putting clips together. And mind you, I kind of started a little bit backwards because in the beginning of my business, I had this whole corporate job that paid me a ton of money and I didn't have the time to edit my own film work and that sort of thing. And so I started in the beginning outsourcing a lot of my work. Gina of Lola Video, who is an amazing artist as well, shoots all analog film work, all Super 8 as well. So she, in the very beginning, was only doing digital and we approached her and we said, hey, can you edit this for me and that sort of thing? And she said, yeah, why not? So she really loved it and she did a fabulous job. And so she started piecing this work together. So slowly but surely, it started developing into me building a blog and starting to blog from my film work. It really not even being a business, it being just something fun that I was showcasing. But another little step that I will jump back to that I forgot about was that first gig that I did. I found out after the final product was done, Jose hands me this check and he's here, you were paid for this job. And I was, what do you mean? And he said, I convinced the couple that you could do this and that you were going to provide them this piece and here's your money. You actually were paid for this job, but I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want to freak you (laughs) out and I didn't want you to spaz out, which I was already really nervous and sweaty. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this and I don't really like attention very much. So I was thinking already as it is when you're the guy in the corner in a ceremony and you're shooting Super 8. And you're the one making all this loud noise when all these special moments are happening. Then people are kind of looking at you like, what is that guy doing? Why is he making noise right now in this special moment? And that moment in time, only the couple understands what's happening. And there's grandparents around who are probably thinking, what's that noise? Is that a bird? Or is that a super camera? Wow. So some people get it. And some people are like, what is that? That's so obtrusive. It's not super loud. But I think people in that quiet moment really notice it. And some people are in agreement with it in that moment. And some people are like, what the heck's going on? So after that, I just kind of started shooting a lot of film and just becoming addicted to it. I never really knew what it would be like to have something that you were passionate about that really makes me feel so many emotions when I do this for my clients. It was an addiction now to do this for people and to capture this for people and to make people feel this. What I was seeing through my eyes, I wanted people to really feel or replicate their emotions or what happened that day of through this film work and through my lens and that sort of thing. So that's really how everything got started. (laughs) Wow, what a great story. I mean, it's so cool, especially the deal Jose says. Oh, by the way, you were getting paid for this, so good thing you you pulled it off. (laughs) Yeah, we talk about it all the time, and he says, wow, you've really built this great business, and it's such a niche market. I mean, people come to me because they want this aesthetic. My potential clients are looking for sound sync or a little bit of digital mix or that sort of thing. That's really not what I take on, and I don't have a problem telling clients that and turning clients down and referring them to fellow filmmakers who do an amazing job at that medium. So I really stick to this look because I'm really passionate about it. And it's funny that we talk about it all the time, how I wasn't told I was getting paid for this, but he said he believed that I could do this, that I could create this. And so that's really amazing to me. It's one of those funky stories, so I thought I'd share it. (laughs) No, it's a great story to be able to talk about how this all starts with. So let's talk about camera gear. I mean, do you expose by hand? Do you hack notch the cameras because the film now is different than it was when they made these things? 
I mean, how tight does this stuff get? Or is it really just sort of like, okay, I'm going to slap this in and we're right. rolling, baby. Let the camera do it. It just whatever happens goes. I think that lighting is key to successful photography or filmmaking. That once you learn that, you really get that down, then you have all of this creative freedom to just create whatever you want and really film something that is going to be beautiful and that sense of things. So my camera is a Canon 512XL. These are all the little secrets. They're going out to the interweb. I'm just kidding. No, it's not a secret. A lot of people will email me and say, what camera are you using? The picture quality is so great and blah, blah, blah. I tell people I use various different cameras because it's the truth. I have a 512XL Canon, and then I have some 514XLs. I had some 1014XLs, but to be honest with you, that camera is a little too heavy for my hand, and it feels a little bit uncomfortable when I'm filming. And so I think that generally the best advice, I think, for anybody who really wants to do this type of film work is find a camera that really fits well in your hand and that feels comfortable because this is why I love the 514 and the 512 so much for that reason for it fitting my hand. It feels like a glove to my hand and it's fast, it's easy to use, and it's what best is suited for me and for my business and for my film work. So This is great. Now, do you have the inspiring want to shoot Super 16 anamorphic format, RE416 or shooting 35 millimeter? You always had the deal where let's take this thing to the super top or is it really right. part of it has to do with the look of Super 8 and the emotion that it conveys versus right. we were shooting a TV series for a wedding deal? No, I think that there's constant debate with that. I mean, I just had lunch with Jose and he's doing like a one-on-one -on -one session right now with the student. So he always tells me, why don't you do 16? And I've dabbled on it a little bit. I think that if I ever did go into it full force, I would definitely be using the Scoopic. I think it's a great camera. But I think that generally, I really am passionate about this medium, and I think it's because the look that it gives, how easy the camera is to use. I think that my clients also like it too, because I feel like film, and Super 8 film especially, has this really cool look to people's faces. It makes it not so sharp. I have nothing against digital, but digital cameras can be really sharp. I don't want to get into the whole digital versus film thing, but to me, film has this really natural glow to people's skin tones and to faces. And so people look really happy and they look good. And I've never had any complaints about someone saying that their skin color doesn't look good or that it looks too sharp or anything like that. So I think that right now I'm really passionate about 8mm film. I think that my business is really well known for that. I want to be so concentrated when I do this for my clients that honestly, I don't know how I could be doing half digital, half film, some 16. I could not do that. I feel like if I reached down to get a 16 millimeter camera and then traded that for the eight and then picked up this other camera with this other lens or whatever, I just feel like I would miss all these moments. The way I work is that camera is attached to my hand all day long and I'm just ready for things to happen. That's kind of how I prepare myself, and that's easy for me, and that's the way I like it, and I don't think that I need to incorporate all this other crazy equipment. I think when you start upgrading to 16, Super 16, 35, or even shooting digital with somewhat decent equipment, 5D Mark II DSLR or high-end video camera, you lose it. It's not the same. I mean, yes, you can convey the moment. You can shoot it. You can right. use the 5D and get shallow depth of the field and blah, blah, blah. But really, Super 8 has that look, especially at 19 frames per second. There's right. a shutter, the film gate's clocking away. I mean, it's very unique, and I think it's very euphoric. It's a very organic-looking image that is, like you said, it's a fairy tale thing almost. It's like, was this real? Is it a dream? It's a trip. You know, it is a trip. But one thing I always ask my clients, because when people inquire with me, I touch base with them through email mostly. Everything is so World Wide Web these days, but I feel like it's so important to hear people's voices and really chat with them and get a sense of what type of film work they're looking for and if we're definitely a match because I definitely want to make sure that my clients for me are people that understand my work and that I understand the way their day is going to unfold the way their wedding is going to be. And so I feel that communicating these processes with people and really understanding what it is that they want and what it is that I'm going to be able to give them with my medium and nailing those down in the first consultation or first chat on the phone is essential to the whole situation with your potential client being successful. So I really like to educate clients and almost sometimes it's kind of like maybe too much information. Sometimes people call and say, hey, can you do this and can you offer that and can you do this and this and that? And people, are, they're going to be very forward with me. Then I can pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, I got your inquiry. It's great. 
I wanted to chat with you, and this is what I can offer you. Do you like what you see now? Yeah, but we think we wanted some digital, and we don't see the vows, and I don't see that portion of it, and I don't hear anything. So I say, I just don't offer that. I think you should contact so-and-so. They offer that. They do a fabulous job. You should go with them. And I think that people really respect that and people really want to be told the truth. I think there's a lot of people out there telling people they can do anything for them. And I think that they do that to necessarily just get the gig or get the job. And I don't work that way because I don't want to be confused that day. I basically don't want to go through all my calendar and all my weddings and show up and say, Okay, tomorrow I'm shooting 16, and then Sunday's wedding I'm shooting Super 8, and oh, they want sound for that, and oh, they want a little bit of digital. I can't work that way. My mind doesn't register that way at all. I kind of want to be who I am and offer the product that is me and show up to the wedding and really just have people understand what I'm creating. And then at that point, it's me. They want me. They didn't hand cherry pick everything that they wanted as far as the examples that I was giving, half 16, half 8, or whatever. They hired me for me, and they know that they're going to get me, and that is the best feeling ever. It's very difficult, and I don't think people understand, to be able to do audio sync with Super 8. It's not an easy fact, and really, these cameras don't have crystal sync. And there's a lot of things that I think traditional photographers don't understand about this gear and cinematography in general. But it's great to see that people are hiring you because what they've seen on the web, they've looked at your work, and this is what you're giving them. And it's not like, well, I want the sound and I want this and that. Well, you know, right. like you said, hey, later, go somewhere else. This is yeah. not my gig. And it's cool to see that you can actually stick to this right. and not cave in and say, well, oh, okay, I'll do it. It's like, no, this is my yeah. deal. Take it or leave it. Right. I just kind of want to really be happy doing this. When I first started my business and doing this from the very beginning, there was a feeling of happiness because I was going to be working for myself and I had my own business and I was running the show and it was my product and what I offered. And there's nothing great than just having clients call me and say, hey, we want to book you. We've been following your work. We really love what you offer. Can you send us a contract? And then there's the other clients that maybe have a little bit more questions and a little bit more concerns as far as how does this film work? Is it a digital final product? And so it's great to answer those little concerns and questions for people. And also, when you get the potential client that wants something that you totally do not offer, then I'm definitely a believer of guiding them to the right situation because I definitely don't want to be in a situation where I'm offering something that I'm not familiar with or that I don't know. I would hate being in that situation. No, and I think that's great to be able to know where your limits are and just draw it and say, well, this is what I want to do, and I don't want to do this. It's not my deal. Go somewhere else. Right. So, Joel, let's talk about the film itself. Are you shooting color, converting to black and white? Tell me about what you do when it comes to what you like for film stock. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm a huge fan of color film. So definitely any day I would rather shoot color than black and white. I think black and white is a little bit trickier for me. I'm not saying that in general. The lighting situation has to truly be dead on in order for me to pull out that black and white camera. If I feel like it's a really controlled environment and the bride is maybe getting ready and there's a beautiful window light and she's standing in a place for a consecutive amount of time, the environment is more controlled than definitely black and white is beautiful. Everything that is seen on my website that is color or black and white is the same exact way it was shot. So nothing has been transferred from color to black and white or any sort of that instance. Everything is true to how it's seen and everything is straight out of the camera. I mean, all the color that you see is naturally that way. And maybe I owe a lot of this to vector film and video, but nothing is enhanced or the contrast isn't changed or anything like that. Everything is true to what it is, and that's why I love shooting this medium, because I feel like as long as I know the lighting situation is right, the color is going to be beautiful, the black and white is going to be beautiful, and yeah, it's as simple as that, really. Do you decide on what I'm going to shoot in color, what's in black and white, or are you just, well, I'm done with this cartridge, I'm going to put a black and white one in now, who knows? Or do you sort of segregate and say, well, I want to shoot this in color, and I'm going to save some black and white for the reception? How do you figure out what goes where? I think that I generally try to talk to my clients a little bit before. One question that I generally ask is, what do you like of my film work and what instances or what clips really touched you? So at that point, I get to know, okay, this person really likes black and white. This couple really likes color. Then I ask questions like, where's your location? Obviously, if their location is inside a really, really dark church for their ceremony, then I'm probably not going to pull out that 200 black and white. It's going to be really grainy and it's probably going to be hard to focus in there and it's probably not going to be the best that it can be. So at that point, maybe I know that even though they like black and white a lot, I have to pull out the higher speed film. 
So clients really just give me the creative freedom to decide whether a moment should be captured in black and white or whether it should be captured in color. I like to say that more classic moments like ceremonies, stuff like that, to me are really classic. And if the lighting situation is perfect, then I definitely pull out the black and white camera and I shoot that the whole time. I sometimes feel, though, that if a wedding has a lot of color and their investments as far as details go, and the scenery is very green or grass or that sort of punchy color or really blue skies with clouds and that sort of thing, then I think that you'd have to be retarded to not want to shoot color. I guess I'm really aware of where I am, and I try to be really critically aware of is this bouquet that this bride is holding have something trickling from it. Is it grandma's old pendant? Is it something special? Is that her something blue? It gets really detailed after you've done this for a while, but I really just pay attention to things and sometimes even shoot a little bit of both. So if I'm not sure on situations and the lighting can be harsh or it's not the best potential if it's an outdoor ceremony, then I shoot a little bit of both. And then once I get it back, I make that decision. Am I going to use the color? Am I going to use the black and white? Am I going to mix a little bit of both? And so I want to say that I use definitely 70% color and the rest is black and white. Have you ever had clients that want a deliverable actually on film so they can project it through a traditional projector? Or is everybody happy with the DVD route? I think everybody's really happy with the DVD route. I do give clients the negative reels and that sort of thing or mini DVs and all of that. Oh, so they I actually get that say, back. You actually hand all that stuff over say, here you go, it's yours. Yeah, I say, here, here it is, it's yours. Generally speaking, though, people really just want a DVD because to them, it's 2010. What are they going to do with all this negative real stuff? How are they going to take care of it? So there's all those questions. So sometimes it's easier to give a client the DVD. But after a year or so, if I have that stuff still lying around in my office, I definitely make a point to send it out to my client. And I make sure to ship it out separate from their other products. So forbid anything happens with shipping, then it's not lost or any sort of thing like that. So with that said, I mean, everything you're shooting is negative, then you don't shoot any actual chrome. Oh, everything is negative film. Again, that's just kind of the aesthetic that I like. I really like that punchy color. And to me, it almost looks like photographs. It really looks like film photography in a way. And a lot of my composition and the way I interact with my couples is very similar to photography. The moments that are captured are kind of like stills, but with motion in them. So I feel like that is my look and that is the way that I tell stories. I like to crop really tight in people's faces when they're kissing. I also like to tell stories from afar and really capture the scenery. And I love lens flare. Almost try to get at every wedding. Of course, if it's raining or that is impossible, then it is impossible. But I really love that harsh flare that just comes through. And I like changing sceneries that way. And when it comes to editing, changing clips, jumping from ceremony to reception, I love doing that with all the harsh lighting and using those natural transitions as far as editing goes. What do you find that clients want for music? Do they have a certain song they want to use? Do you pick things for them? I mean, do they give you creative control when you get to add music to the movies? 97% of my clients give me creative freedom. I've had a couple of instances where clients say they want to give me creative freedom. Mind you, this is all in my contracts and everything unless it's negotiated beforehand, everything is creative freedom for me because that's how I work best. I try to get a feel of the client's music and what they're listening to the day of their wedding, just what type of people they are and what genre of music they like and that sort of thing. So I make little mental notes here and there. I pull out Shazam every so often and I try to grab a song that was really important for them or something like that. But I try to really just find music that goes with the couple And really, I haven't had any concerns or problems with picking any music that people don't like. Sometimes I'll pick a song that I feel is great, but the couple will say, we thought we were going to have the ability to choose a song or something. So then at that moment, I know, okay, they wanted a little bit more of an input in it. Then I kind of, at that point, ask them, well, what type of genre were you thinking of instead of this song? They kind of say, you wanted something a little more classic. So at that time, I still have the creative freedom. I pick something a little more classic for them. And they end up loving it without them necessarily telling me, we want to make sure that it's this song and this title and this artist and from this DVD. I really don't work that way. And I think people like that. I just kind of take full control and have that creative freedom for them because they like the product that I'm offering in the first place. Joel, tell me about the length of your movies. I mean, typically Super 8 is a few minutes in length. You have 50 feet worth of film. So depending on what frame per second you're shooting at, so forth and so on. So tell me, are you making five-minute movies? Are you making three-hour massive productions? Tell me about how you're conveying this story and this type of footage. 
It's really simple. I think that people sometimes think that I'm out there shooting 50 rolls of film and having four hours worth of footage and narrowing it down to like a 15-minute clip or a five-minute clip, that sort of thing. Typically, the clips that are on my website or on my blog, those clips are generally anywhere between three to five minutes. Those are kind of the highlighted clips that I like to call them. Those kind of concentrate more on the couple themselves, all the little key little moments that are very special, but mainly just the love and the couple and those really intimate shots towards sunset lighting and that sort of thing. The longer version, say for about a five to a six hour event, those tend to be for about 15 minutes long for a full final product. Now, it'll have various different music in it, uh, different ins and outs as far as editing and telling a story that way. Those have more family shots, more of a storytelling basis, like when the bride is getting ready and that sort of thing, to them cutting the cake and it being the first dance and that sort of thing. Typically, from a higher time from 5 to 10 hours, you're looking at about a 15-minute final product to about a 35 max final product. Of course, every wedding is different. I'm being hired for different times for different situations. Some stuff is even custom. So really, sometimes I have made one-hour-long movies But generally, the short snippets are shorter because they get people's attention. People don't want to show an hour or two hour long wedding video to their friends and family. They really want to show the key little moments that concentrate on them because the wedding was about the couple themselves in love. So I think that showcasing those short 15 minutes are perfect. It has a really cool song to it. And people really dig that. And that's something that you can show to your friends and family over and over. And then those longer versions are more for closer friends and family and can sit and watch those for the full 15 to 30 minutes, then maybe you'll want to watch them for an hour straight over and over instead of watching a full hour. So it's kind of that sort of short aesthetic, very to the point and very captured and very basic. So every roll of film is really only about two and a half minutes long. Therefore, everything that really is shot is almost dead on. So I can typically shoot a wedding for about six rolls for about a five-hour wedding. So there's a lot of fellow filmmakers out there who have asked me how much footage I shoot. And when they hear me say, six rolls for a five-hour wedding? Are you kidding? Oh, my God, that's crazy. It's only two and a half minutes for each roll. How do you get that? So I just think I'm really patient and I'm really alert of what's happening. And I try to capture that moment and really not waste any of the footage. So it's almost like if I'm shooting photography, but with a little bit of motion. And I really pay attention to my shots. And almost, I'd say 95% of each roll is 100% dead on and useful footage for my final editing product. No, I find that very cool that you've been able now to see what's going on and anticipate, okay, I'm going to pull it here and squeeze off 20 seconds. And then I see the next deal, I'm going to squeeze off 30 seconds or 10 seconds. Yeah, I think that that totally comes natural. And for me, I think it gets better and better the longer I do this. You just have this inner intuition that you know this is going to happen. Okay, this is happening right now, but I know that there's going to be a better instance of that. And surely it happens over and over. People are really emotional when weddings and events like this happen. So I think that just training your eye to know what is going to happen before it does generally makes a great film that way too. I mean, just knowing that the moment is coming and waiting for it. And once you shoot it, you got it. You don't have to redo it. You don't have to fake it. Just be patient and get it. There's a lot of people who shoot to try to compensate for shots that they don't want to wait for. I would rather be patient and wait and have the moment be real than try to act it out in my film work and try to pretend like it's something special that really wasn't, but just trying to capture things how they naturally happen the first time instead of filming them in a way to where it seems that it's coming up to that special moment that really meant nothing. It was just for an editing purpose. I try to really make sure that the moment that it's captured is really going to tell the story the way it really happened. And therefore, it makes my editing job way easier at the end. Well, plus it's a waste of film and resources, even more so. I think if you look at a lot of people that shoot video or even digital still, they're almost to the point to where it's just put it on burst and let it run. Yeah, I think that a lot of people have that approach that they constantly just have to be rolling and capturing everything. And then they bring it to the computer and they are, wow, I have three hours or two hours worth of footage. How am I going to do this? And plus, I'm sure it cost them an arm and a leg to shoot all of that 8mm film or all of that 16mm, whatever your medium is, or even if you're digital, all of those cards that you're filling up with tons of gigabytes of footage or whatever. So I generally just try to be very aware and dead on with my shots. And it makes it really easy for me when I come onto the computer and I'm editing on Final Cut Pro 
At that moment in time, sometimes I love to leave the shutter open and have some of those really cool light leaks. And so those make natural transitions in my films. So sometimes I don't have to do anything. The story is really told exactly the way it was shot with those natural transitions happening. Whether one of the transitions is flare or one of the transitions is more of a light leak in the film itself. So just stuff like that is what I love. And that makes me love this even more because it's less work for me in the back end. And it really looks so organic and true to what it is. Sometimes people will email me and say, hey, how do you do those transitions or how do you do this? And I say, hey, it's just film and there isn't a filter that I bought. It's just the way that it is, natural and simple. Yeah, I think this is just another point of keeping your eye on what's going on and knowing the environment and what you're doing. It's just the skill set shows. You're definitely rocking it, buddy. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your comments, Scott. So with all the movies that you've shot and the places you've got to go and do all these things, give me a scenario that you haven't got to do yet that you're looking forward to. Well, that's really a tough question, I think. There must be somewhere that you want to shoot, some way you want to shoot. There must be something burning there that's like, okay, I really want to do this, man. How can we get this? I think that I would love to shoot in Brazil. I think that it's an amazing place from what I've seen through photographs and that sort of thing. I don't know if there's a specific location, theme, or wedding that I'm looking to reach out to and to document, but I think that my goal is to just have couples who truly are themselves in their environment. So I guess the reason that I was bringing up Brazil was maybe it would be great to shoot a wedding from a local person who's from Brazil, and with all of their traditions and that sort of thing happening, them being in their element and then being happy. Those are my goals, is shooting weddings that way. Destinations are so huge nowadays that sometimes you get a couple that's from New York getting married in California, and they're just wanting to do the whole destination wedding thing and go get married in Napa Valley. That's not really their element. Maybe it's the look of the wedding and their style and design that they want to achieve, but it's even better when a couple is from their native environment and they are happy and they know the location. And to me, it's like aesthetically beautiful. And then to them, they're enjoying themselves because it really means something very special to them. Does that make sense at all? <laughs> no, it does. The question I have is, do you find that other photographers recommend you? Do you also work with other people besides Jose when it comes to shooting this stuff? Because most traditional photographers shoot still, and they recommend or have some other thing with the motion capture. Do you find that other people right. are recommending you, and you're getting to do other gigs as well besides working with Jose? Yeah, a lot of times people think Jose and I only work together, and that's not true. So I really want to put that out there. We do have a handful of weddings together every year. And that, I think, just has to be naturally because we're both shooting film. It's a very similar color and aesthetic. So I think that people who like that route and that aesthetic definitely stumble upon my work or maybe Jose mentions my work to them or something like that. And so they definitely like that approach to it. Definitely, though, I don't just work with film shooters. I work with digital shooters all the time. There's a huge variety of different photographers that I've worked with, whether they're in different states or whether they're friends of friends and that sort of thing, or they refer me. And yeah, I think photographers are kind of like my best friends. They definitely send some work my way, and I think that naturally we work really well together. I try to not be in the way of people's shots or other photographers or that sort of thing. And I think that just having that upbringing of working with Jose and constantly being aware of his needs and him being aware of my needs, I think that I've naturally adapted to working with anybody in whatever medium, whether it's digital or whether it's film. I think that it's just great to naturally adapt to how that person works and observe it and then kind of do from there. And really, I stay from afar and I let most of the photographers do a lot of the directing. But generally, if I feel like something is going the complete opposite of what I normally do or the product and aesthetic that I offer to my client, then I sometimes step in a little bit and I'll say, hey, can I just have three minutes here and three minutes there? So generally, the photographer is okay with that, and so is the client, because they obviously want to make sure that we achieve the look that they're getting with hiring me. So, Joel, tell me where people can look at your work. Let's tell them about the website, the blog, and, of course, other photographers that are shooting still can climb on board and recommend you, and they can go shoot with you, and you can shoot with them. And how's all this stuff work where people can get a hold of you? People can see my work online, joelserato.com. That's J-O-E-L. S-E-R-R-A-T-O dot com. And you can go to joelserratoblog.com to see more of the recent work. Really just contact through email and that sort of thing. A lot of my clients are internet-based, but I love chatting on the phone. I love hearing people's voices and connecting that way instead of having it be really robotic and do emails back and forth. 
So it's as simple as that, I guess. I think the point is, is that you're open to working with anybody. I mean, really, you're doing your gig, and I think you can work with other photographers as well. And other photographers can use you and include in their packages, and it can be a friendly arrangement all the way around. Yeah, no, I definitely don't have any problem working with people who are digital or other film shooters. I think that there's a big misconception out there that if you shoot film, then you only work with film people or you don't work with digital people, and that's really not the case. Maybe 95% of the other photographers that I work with throughout the year all shoot digital, and I'm the only film shooter doing the film work. So I'm definitely open to working with other people, and don't worry, I don't have any tripods. Everything's handheld. So there isn't any tripod that'll be in anybody's way, tripping anybody or anything like that. So it's very simple work, and it's me in the little bag that I come to the wedding with. And it's not nothing that's really complicated or all these crazy lights or anything like that. Like you said, it's very low key and you're not intrusive. There is no tripods and there's no big monster tungsten lights or anything. It's very low key. It's totally low key. And I think that that's the best way for me and my approach because I really don't want to be carrying a lot of heavy equipment. I don't want to have a lot of crazy lighting where people are just going to be aware that I'm there and turn away or not really be themselves if they feel that there's this huge beam of light in their face or anything like that. So I really just kind of want to be like mixed into the crowd and pretend like I'm another guest. One of my favorite times to shoot is when people are dancing and that sort of thing. I really like to shoot black and white, like 200 speed with light. And so it kind of breaks apart and has really cool grain. I really love that look at nighttime. And so when I shoot those types of looks, sometimes I even am dancing in the crowd. I'm waving my camera up in the air. So people kind of had a couple drinks in them or they don't really realize that I'm the filmmaker. And so they kind of just start dancing. That's how I really get those really cool moments and interact with the guests themselves. And then later on, people see that I actually have a camera. And they're like, wait a minute, that guy was dancing in the crowd and he was actually the filmmaker. So that's kind of weird. But hey, made for good filmmaking. And I think my couple really appreciate that. And when they see their friends and family really being themselves and it being captured all on film. This is cool stuff, Joel. The movies are spectacular. The stuff's beautiful. The way that you're able to convey the day and this look. It's fabulous work, and I really urge people to go check out your website, your blog, and check out what you're up to because it's really cool. Thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate you interviewing me. Yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions, I'm an open book. I love to share what I do, and I love capturing it all in film, so thanks for having me. It is cool, and I do look forward to having you back to chat some more about this very cool topic about cinematography and using film for motion capture. Great stuff, Joel. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Well, there you go. Joel Serrato, what a great guy, what a bunch of cool stories, and of course he makes these unbelievable, beautiful motion pictures. That's right, Joel the Movie Maker, pretty cool stuff with him, and of course, it's analog photography, it doesn't matter if it's one frame or 100,000, it's still cool stuff. Definitely check out his website, look at his movies, see what he's up to, great inspiration, and a cool guy, definitely check out Joel's work. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film. And, of course, fine quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends at Photo Publicist, worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the finest quality lab in the country, richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at dr5.com. Upstrap for the finest quality camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder at upstrap-pro.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com. And, of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group at apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, over at eastmanhouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Shippard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 